This past year, we experienced more than our share of storms. It was Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston and left it flooded for months. Hurricane Irma devastated Cuba and stripped it of its crops. When I was there two weeks ago, the chickens were still not laying eggs, if you can imagine. It's part of, they, they must lay a, a, a thousand uh, during a hurricane, and then they have nothing for six months afterwards. The, all their, the banana crops were all stripped from Cuba. Hurricane Maria, of course, devastated Puerto Rico, and we were in the thick of helping them with relief. Mexico City, the most populated city on earth, was devastated by two earthquakes back to back. I talked with a, a couple that survived those. The first one, they were inside their apartment, and the walls of their apartment looked like curtains waving. The second earthquake that hit Mexico City, they were outside, and the asphalt looked like jump rope just swaying in front of their eyes. There's all types of storms that hit us. There's emotional storms of grief that comes from a loved one who dies and is gone, or a divorce that we suffer, family storms. I think of the guilt and shame storm that so many, particularly women, have faced in this wave of me too, of all the me too. Uh, that one violated me too. The Hollywood producers, the, the TV stars, the politicians, and even church leaders violating others. And the wave of lament that has overtaken our country. You can't watch any news stream without being hit by scandal here and scandal there, and all the, the lament of violation and abuse, molestation that we are living through in our day, all that storm against morality and decency and purity, innocence, and what makes it even worse is that storms seem to be accentuated during the holidays. Something that any other time of year we can survive, but the holidays seem to bring it all to the surface like never before. Well, church, I stand before us this morning with a song for the storms. I have a word from God. It comes to us from Psalm 29 and would encourage you to take your Bible, whether on your uh, device, tablet, uh, smartphone, or hard copy Bible, but turn with me now to Psalm 29. We saw how this psalm is built around the Middle East weather pattern with a storm that begins forming over the Mediterranean to the west, and the storm builds and Thunder and lightning is heard and seen rumbling over the waters. That's verses 3 and 4. And then the storm comes over land, over Palestine, from, from uh, really the, the bottom of Israel uh, all the way up to Lebanon. And the cedars break, and animals give birth prematurely, and all these things take place as the storm hits the land. And then verses 8 and 9, with the storm that disappears over the Saudi Arabia desert, the wilderness. And that's the heart of Psalm 29. But really, the psalm has three parts. Verses 1 and 2 is a call to praise before the storm. Verses 3 through 9 are to hear the voice of the Lord during the storm. And verses 10 and 11 is to receive the blessing of God after the storm. 
But the beginning verses, which we're going to look at this morning, and the ending verses, which we're going to look at this morning, frame the storm. There's this huge storm that comes in the middle of the psalm, but before it comes, there's a call to praise, and after the storm, there's a call to receive the blessing of God in the middle of the devastation that the storm has left. It begins with three calls to elevate the beauty of God's name. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Like a three secure, but elevated, or three prongs that hold the jewel. There's these three prongs or legs that hold this psalm, and they're calls to elevate the character of God. Ascribe to the Lord, even calling on angels, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord according to his character, glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Almost like the Lord's Prayer, beginning with, hallowed be your name. Now, the character of God sits unaffected by circumstances. And when we face storms, when we go through a time when circumstances are difficult or bad or depressing, when we face the guilt and the shame of living in this world and making some wrong choices, when we face storms, whether emotional or family or financial or whatever level of storm we're facing, it's a call, first of all, to declare the character of God which is perfect and unaffected by the circumstances we face. And I want to say, if your praise is circumstantial, that is to say, if you only praise God when the sun is shining, there is already a problem in your relationship with God. If your praise does not come willingly, voluntarily to the Lord when things are difficult, just as easily as when things are smooth, then there's already a problem. But this psalm begins with this incredible threefold call to praise, to declare the virtues of God. And then it ends with this deep, this deep exhortation. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. This is not some trivial response in worship. In fact, there is no deeper call than to not only encounter the holiness of God, to not only see the holiness of God, but to press into the holiness of God and to see the holiness of God not as a threat, but as a winsome, desirable virtue to worship the Lord in the splendor, in the beauty, in the radiance of his holiness. You see, when we first encounter the holiness of God, frankly, we want to turn and run. Isaiah did. Woe is me. When he encountered the holiness of God, he heard the angels crying, holy, holy, holy. He was worshiping the holiness of God, but he said, woe is me. He tried to cover himself. He winced. He squinted. He wanted to turn away. Woe is me. I am undone. It means I'm disintegrating. I'm coming apart at the seams. For I am a man of unclean lips. 
and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord, the Holy One. So Isaiah winced, but here in this worship, the call to worship God in the splendor of his holiness, it's like we've already been disintegrated, but now we're rising back to our feet and pressing into his holiness and saying, more, Lord, more. I want to worship you more into your holiness. I want you to do inside of me everything that you want to do as I worship you. Now, this call is only given three times in the scriptures. I've always paid attention to it because it's like, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. What is that? What is that? Now, it's only three times. It's right here in Psalm 29, verse 2. It's repeated. The same words that were first written in Psalm 29, verse 2, are repeated in Psalm 96, verse 9. It's the same thing, ascribed to the Lord. The glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The same call to ascribe and the same call to worship in the splendor of his holiness is repeated in Psalm 96. And the only other place is in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 29, when the Ark of the Covenant is brought into Jerusalem. When David brings it into the streets of Jerusalem, and this is the place where David danced before the Lord with all his might, and some people were offended he was dancing so vigorously, and there David says, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. It's the only other place. But it's here in Psalm 29, even before the storm starts cutting loose, before the thunderhead forms and the, and the trees around us start snapping. Even before the storm hits, God invites us into his presence to worship him in the splendor of his holiness. And I want to say to you, if there is a storm cloud coming, or if you have been through a storm, or you are in one right now, let me call you, don't dabble in the shallow end of praise. Jump in the deep end. You can't afford to lose this battle. God wants you to worship in the deep end. Jump into the deep end and worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. For some of us this morning, this is not just uh, fiery preaching. This is a life or death issue. For some of you are facing difficult situations. You're facing deep waters. You might be facing a storm of depression that's getting the better of you. And you are convinced by the way you feel that you cannot praise the Lord. The call of Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2, are not circumstantial. You don't get to uh, draw a, this doesn't apply to me card, when it comes to praising the Lord. And when you're facing a storm, you need to praise all the more significantly. You need his virtue. You need his presence. And you need to encounter the beauty and the purity and innocence and splendor of his holiness. If you whether you've done it or not, if you could text or if you could iMessage or you could Facebook, me too. If you've experienced the ravage to your own body and your own soul of having been violated, God calls you to himself to worship you, to, to worship him in the splendor of his holiness. This world is not pure. What happened to you was a violation. It was an injustice. 
But that does not destroy the justice and purity of your God. So with that as a call to worship, then we come to the middle part, the middle verses, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, seven times the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord echoes, it shatters, it strips the forest bare. It does all these things. It makes the deer give birth, the voice of the Lord. In the storm, the voice of the Lord is echoing for you. The voice of the Lord is yours to receive in the storm. Going through the hard times of life, the voice of the Lord is there. Speaking, 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 speaking. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of the devastation, as you see it coming, as it envelops you, as you look around and you wonder what happened and you see nothing but broken pieces. In those times, the voice of the Lord. And when the voice of the Lord comes, there is nothing you need more. One word from God will do in you everything that you need from him. The voice of the Lord is living and active. It's penetrating. It's relevant. It's applicable to you and to your situation, the voice of the Lord. But then we come to the third part of Psalm 29, verses 10 and 11. And it begins with this incredible declaration. When the psalmist looks around and he sees a bunch of broken trees, a bunch of devastation, and the crops are gone, and he feels violated, and he's more aware of the devastation than he is of anything else. But in that moment, Psalm 29, verse 10, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. Now that word flood is only used 16 times in the Bible. Listen carefully. 16 times in the Bible, that word flood. It's used once here, Psalm 29, verse 10, and the other 15 times in Genesis 6 to 11. The only other time this word is used in the Bible, it refers to Noah's flood. Total devastation where it says in verse 10, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. This is not talking about a little rain shower, a little inconvenience, a little, well, I had to put up my umbrella. This is more than a, a, a Georgia gully washer. If this was an earthquake, it would measure at least 8.9 on the Richter scale. If it's a fire, it would be a six alarm fire. If it was a hurricane, it would be category six. This is the Lord sits enthroned over the devastation, over the destruction. The Lord sits enthroned over my mess. That's what it's saying. Now, the word sits. It's not like sitting in an ivory tower. It doesn't mean sit like aloof. It's the, it's the same word to marry someone or to spread out on your couch, to feel right at home, to dwell with permanently, to take up residence. The Lord feels at home over our mess. The Lord settles into our broken pieces. 
the Lord makes himself known to us in the middle of our devastation, in the storms and in the aftermath of the storm. When we get the word cancer and we see it take its toll, the Lord sits enthroned. The Lord settles in. He feels right at home in the middle of those storms. Now, I need to say right here, one of the worst heresies that was born in my generation was the health wealth gospel. The statement that basically would deny Psalm 29, verse 10. The Lord seats all of us apart from this flood. That's what they would rewrite Psalm 29, verse 10. Or the Lord sits aloof off somewhere and takes us off with him when there's a flood. Brothers and sisters, that is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is the one who makes himself known and who settles in to our devastation and into our messes, who makes himself known in beautiful ways after we have been ripped off, stolen from, exploited. How do I know, pastor, if the Lord is in, sitting in my mess with me, enthroned over it and in it? How do I know? It's very simple. This is a simple thing. The question is to you, what is bigger in your life, your storm or your savior? If your savior is bigger than your storm, then the Lord is enthroned over your flood. If your storm is bigger than your savior, then he's not. You see, it's simple. It's just logical. If you can say today, I'm going through a hard time, but my God is bigger than my circumstances, then the Lord is sitting enthroned over your flood. And if you have drifted from that place, today I call you back. You don't want to live in a world where circumstances are sovereign. Not now, not tomorrow, not ever. We live in a world where our God is sovereign. He's sovereign over the storms. It was C.S. Lewis who put his finger on this whole problem of pain. And he wrote in A Grief Observed, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's pain. You don't want a theology that denies the existence of pain. But we have a Savior who is familiar with suffering. He's acquainted with grief. He took up our sicknesses. He carried our sorrows. He's with us in the storm. He sits enthroned over our flood. That's our God. And more poetically, Madeline Langle, one of my favorite writers in graduate school, pain is a partner I did not request. This is a dance I did not ask to join. World in a waltz where I would stop and rest, jolted and jerked, I ache in bone and joint. Pain strives to hold me close in its embrace. If I resist and pull away, his grasp grows tighter. Closer comes his face, hotter his breath. If he is here to stay, then I must learn to dance this painful dance. Move to its rhythm. Keep my lagging feet in time with his. 
Thus have I a chance to gain with pain, and so may pain defeat. Pain is my partner. If I dance with pain, then may this wedlock be not loss, but gain. Only Christ gives you grace to dance with pain, not for loss, but gain. Because in that, you encounter the Christ who feels with all of our infirmities. It is the beauty of the gospel. Now, pastor, what's the effect of Christ being enthroned over the flood? Verse 11. There are two virtues that exist in God that he communicates to us in the flood. When we know that he is enthroned, these two are the byproduct. These two virtues that we desperately need for the flood, for the aftermath of the storm, is strength and peace. Verse 11, may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Peace. It's the last word. It's the final word. It starts with a scribe by elevating the virtues of God, and it ends by receiving the virtues of God. Anyone, in a sense, can elevate his virtues, but only his children can receive his virtues. Not all his virtues are communicable. God's all-knowing. No matter how much you receive from God, you're never going to be all-knowing. God's everywhere at the same time. No matter how much you download from the Lord, you're never going to be everywhere at the same time. At times as a pastor, I wish I could be everywhere at the same time. That would really come in handy as a pastor. But it doesn't work that way. God's all-powerful. No matter how much you download from the Lord, you're never going to be all-powerful. There's certain virtues that God retains for himself, but there are many which are called the communicable virtues. Now, is the Lord strong? Of course. Strength is downloadable. We receive strength when he sits enthroned over our flood. We receive strength. And when he sits enthroned over our flood, we receive peace. Strength to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not magical, it's not hocus pocus, but as the Lord is enthroned, over your flood, you and I get to receive from him the empowerment to walk through it and the peace to know that it's going to be okay. He's going to see me through this. So this morning we've crafted our worship time to give time for response so that all of us have an opportunity to, whether we have in the past or not, but today to affirm that Christ is enthroned over my flood. Over the stuff I'm going through, Christ is enthroned. And to receive as a response, to receive the strength and the peace of God. Will you enthrone Christ in your flood today. Worship team, if you would please come and prepare to lead us. And I'd like to ask uh, 
some of our elders and prayer team members, if you would get in pairs of two in the front and maybe a couple at the back as well so that we can appropriately bring our flood, bring our storm to the Lord and to declare his strength for us in the middle of the flood and the storm. Let's all stand together. Father, we put ourselves before you. Your word has strengthened us and fed us and exhorted us. And Lord, it's now our time to respond in worship, to ascribe to you glory and strength, to ascribe to you the glory that is due your name, and to worship you in the splendor of your holiness. And Lord, we bind, I bind right now depression in Jesus' name. I bind self-hatred in Jesus' name. I bind those lying voices of guilt and shame in Jesus' name. And Father, I loose your welcome. I loose your grace and your truth. You, O oh Lord, are a shield around us. You are our glory and the lifter of our heads. You are enthroned over the flood, and we declare it. And Lord, move inside our hearts right now. God. 